cervical cancer. So if you haven't already, I would start off by watching last week's video on cervical smears, so that you first get a background on the subject. Okay, so cervical cancer is the second most common female malignancy. There are two main types, and these are squamous cell carcinoma, which constitutes a good 80% of cervical cancers, and adenocarcinoma, which covers about 10-15% to of cases. Other rare tumors of the cervix include neuroendocrine tumors. Now before we move on, a quick note about cervical intrapetelial neoplasia, which is the premalignant lesion leading to cervical cancer. SIN is a histological diagnosis, which is obtained after colposcopy and cervical biopsy. So as we can see in this image here, we've got normal squamous cells throughout the epithelium. Then we've got abnormal cells in the lower one-third of the epithelium, which makes this SIN1. Next, we've got abnormal cells in the lower two-thirds of the epithelium, making this SIN2. And here we've got abnormal cells throughout the full thickness of the epithelium, making this SIN3. Now, as you can see here, if the abnormal squamous cells invade the basement membrane, now this is referred to as invasive cancer. Good. So let's have a look at some histology images. So we've got SIN1 here with abnormal cells in the lower one third. SIN2 with abnormal cells in the lower two thirds. And SIN3 with abnormal cells in the full thickness of the epithelium. Now, if a result of SIN1, SIN2 or SIN3 is obtained from a cervical biopsy, being a precancerous lesion, we of course need to get rid of it. And this is excised by means of a LETS procedure. LETS refers to large loop excision of the transformation zone. So as you can see here, a cutting diatermy loop is used to remove a small part of the cervix. The sample is then sent to the lab to examine it further and ensure that the precancerous lesion has been removed completely with an adequate margin. Complications associated with a LETS procedure include bleeding and pain, although they are rare. One thing to inform the patient undergoing a LETS procedure is her risk of subsequent preterm delivery. Since we are taking a chunk of the cervix out, the cervix may not be as strong, resulting in cervical incompetence during a pregnancy later on. Good. So back to our discussion on cervical cancer. So cervical cancer occurs in 8 per 100,000 women. It can occur at any age, however, there are two main peaks of incidence. So as you can see from the graph here, we have the main peak at around the age of 30, and another peak at age 80. Now, we've got some risk factors associated with cervical cancer. The first is human papilloma virus, HPV. The most common subtypes causing cervical cancer are HPV 16, 18, 31, 33 and 35. This is the single most common cause for cervical cancer, being the primary cause in more than 90% of cases. Therefore, HPV is super important when discussing cervical cancer. A video based only on HPV is coming up soon. Now, other risk factors include smoking, the oral contraceptive pill, and immunocompromised states, such as HIV, and patients on long-term steroids. Now, how do these patients present? So, the main presenting complaint that should send alarm bells ringing in your ears is postcoital bleeding. That should immediately make you think about cervical cancer. Other possible symptoms may include offensive vaginal discharge, intermenstrual bleeding, and postmenopausal bleeding. Patients may also have symptoms related to cancer spread if they have advanced cancer. So, if it has invaded the ureters, they may present with uremia. If invaded the bladder, they may present with hematuria. If invaded the rectum, they may have rectal bleeding. And if invaded the nerves, they may present with pain. On examination, one might find an ulcer or cervical mass. Good. So next, moving on to the diagnosis. So, of course, if a patient presents with any of those symptoms, a smear test must be taken because we want to take a look at the cells. In my previous video, we discussed about how we take a smear test. So this will give us a cytological diagnosis. 
Next, a colposcopy will be performed and the cervical biopsy taken. This will be sent to the lab to give us the histological diagnosis. And this is when the actual diagnosis of cervical cancer is made. Once we, had a, we have identified that we're dealing with a cancer, we must prepare the patient for further management. So a CT and MRI is performed for staging. Okay, good. So let's discuss staging now. So this is the FIGO staging of cervical cancer. So in stage one, the lesions are confined to the cervix. In 1A1, the lesion has invaded less than 3 mm in depth and has spread laterally less than 7 mm. In 1A2, the lesion has invaded more than 3 mm in depth but less than 5 mm and has spread laterally less than 7 mm. Both these lesions can only be seen with a microscope and can't be seen with a naked eye. In 1B1, the lesion can now be seen clinically, but it is smaller than 4 cm in its greatest diameter. In 1B2, the lesion is more than 4 cm in its greatest diameter. Now in stage 2, the cancer starts invading into the vagina and pelvic sidewall. So in 2A1, the cancer has invaded into the upper two-thirds of the vagina without invasion into the sidewalls and is less than 4 cm in size while in 2A2 it is larger than 4 cm in size. In stage 2B, the cancer has invaded into the pelvic sidewall. In stage 3, the cancer has invaded into the lower vagina or pelvic sidewall and may result in ureteric obstruction. And in stage 4, the cancer has now invaded into the bladder or rectal mucosa or beyond the true pelvis. Okay. So we must define the staging of a cancer so that we know exactly what the most appropriate management will be. All these cases are always discussed at a multidisciplinary meeting, which will include gynecologists, oncologists, radiologists and pathologists, all giving their input on the case. Okay, so for stage 1A1, a cone biopsy is performed. This essentially involves the removal of a cone-shaped piece of tissue from the cervix. This is sent to the lab to ensure the margins are clear. Like the LETS, this may also lead to, us to cervical incompetence in the future. Cervical cancer stage 1A2 to 1B1 may undergo a laparoscopic lymphadenectomy to confirm that lymph nodes are not involved and a radical trachelectomy. A radical trachelectomy refers to surgical removal of the cervix, and this is performed in women who wish to preserve their fertility. Next, stages 1A2 to 2A may undergo a Wertheim's radical hysterectomy or chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So, the surgical option is performed in younger patients who are fit for surgery and have completed their family while the chemotherapy-radiotherapy option is offered to older patients who are unfit for surgery. A Wertheim's hysterectomy refers to the complete removal of the uterus, cervix, upper vagina and parametrium, together with a lymphadenectomy. Usually, the ovaries and tubes are left in situ, but not always. Now, if the stage is 2B or more, the cancer is no longer amenable to surgery and the patient may undergo chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Great, so now, lastly, a note about prevention. So, what measures can be taken to prevent cervical cancer from occurring? So, firstly, cervical cancer screening has proven to be the most important. Early detection and treatment can prevent cancer developing in 75% of cases. Next, the HPV vaccine can prevent the acquisition of the most common cause of cervical cancer, HPV. Other ways to prevent cervical cancer are to stop smoking, to use barrier contraception, and to lead a healthy lifestyle. Great. So that's it about cervical cancer. I hope this was helpful. Like and subscribe. Thanks.